It's the radio guy, Mike Prince. Welcome to another episode of the Mike Prince Show Live. Our mission is to bring you something on a daily basis. Monday through Fridays, we meet you at 10 a.m. Sundays, we come to you live. Our social media handles for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are all at the Mike Prince Show. The YouTube channel is Open Mic Broadcast Network. Our website, obnradio.com. We have a 24-hour dial-in message line, 713-570-6736. We got a fam you invasion on tonight. Our first scheduled guest will be almost part two. We had a little weather issue down in Florida. We'll hear from Mickey Clayton. He's with Insights, former being a women's basketball coach as well as athletic director for fam you rappers and then we'll hear from the 1978 fam rattler football national champion player that was on that team mr sheldon hodge we'll hear from him on tonight want we'll to thank our sponsors prairie view athletic club temple of refuge ministries helping hands lawn service brazos valley schools credit union Attorney Lee Van Richardson, Farmers Insurance of Hempstead, Texas. You guys can be a part of the train as well. Just reach out to us at 832-213-8824. And I'm pretty sure we got a package that'll fit your need. Now we got all that out the way. Let us jump right into today's episode. Well, I hope that all is well, wherever you may be listening from. It's Sunday evening, at least in the central standard time zone. A lot going on in the world of athletics. Still some uncertainties about what will be done, how shall it be done. Meanwhile, life is moving forward. Fam, you, of course, still the hot ticket coming to be a part of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And with all the pandemic issues going on, I've been feeling of late, man, let's just kind of fast forward, get through 2020. Everybody go back to the whiteboard. Can't say the chalkboard anymore. Go back to the whiteboard, formulate your plans, make sure the health issues are taken care of, you're closer to a cure, and then come out, with the 2021 fall campaign and let everybody be somebody do your online classes through this 2020 campaign. Yes. I know it's a heartache and a hardship that some seniors will not be able to compete. Some guys who have professional aspirations on the athletic side of things. I still say that if you are on the radar, you will still have an opportunity to shine. And speaking of shining, we broke down the budgets this week, and we'll go over that again later on through the show, in particular with our second scheduled guest, Mr. Hodge, because not only was he a part of the 1978 FAM U National Championship team, he also served on the coaching staff at Mississippi Valley for 12 years. And we'll talk about that as we get a little bit further on into the show. Still uncertainties with the world of baseball as far as Major League Baseball is concerned. And back to the college scene, U of H had six student athletes test positive. And they're steady popping all over the country. I think 13 states have announced some peak in the virus explosion. So there's still, as we mentioned, so many uncertainties, and we just don't know where this thing is going to be. Pine Bluff, Arkansas, made the announcement that they have shut down men and women's 
tennis. Will that be all? Will there be more? We'll find out, as they say, soon and very soon. We're going to take us a break and we'll come back. We'll have our first scheduled guest on the night, and that's none other than Mickey Clayton from Insights. You're listening to the Mike Prince Show, the live version. Keep it right where you got it, and I promise you, we will be right back. Are you looking to expand your business or services? Let the Open Mic Broadcast Network help lead the way. With our customized campaigns, we are definitely able to reach your target audience. For more information, dial 832-213-8824. The Open Mic Broadcast Network, serving the community through faith and athletics. The voice of student athletics. I present to you three of the fiercest subjects ever assembled in the cage of doom. First, the brain-wrenching behemoth, Algebra 2, weighing in at a mind-boggling 800 pounds. Foreign languages! The multilingual international sensation capable of tossing you clear across the Atlantic. And finally, biology. More ferocious than formaldehyde, she'll dissect you one chromosome at a time. Who among you will step up to their challenge? Uh, yeah, I'll do it. Me too. I'm in. Sign me up. Take on the tough classes now. You need them to prepare for college. Find out which classes you need at knowhowtogo.org. Brought to you by the American Council on Education, Lumina Foundation for Education, and the Ad Council. We'd like to take this time to recognize our sponsors and supporters at the Open Mic Broadcast Network, Brazos Valley Schools Credit Union, Temple of Refuge Ministries, Prairie View Athletic Club, Attorney Lee Van Richardson, Farmers Insurance of Hempstead, Texas, Diva Skin Conditioner, Helping Hands Lawn Service. Thank you for your support of our local and regional coverage of student athletics here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. One voice. It can get the point across, but it only carries so far. Add a voice. It's richer, louder, but that has limits too. Add a third voice. It's even more powerful. Add another, and another, and many, many more, and we are stronger than ever. That's the power of a community coalition. They help community groups. Faith groups, civic organizations, PTAs, employers, and many others in your community organize their resources and focus them where they're needed most, like fighting to keep kids away from drugs. Ask a group that you belong to if they should belong to a community coalition. It's easy to get involved. Visit helpyourcommunity.org and they'll tell you exactly how your group can help. That's helpyourcommunity.org, because you get more when we get together. Brought to you by the Office of National Drug Control Policy and the Ad Council. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mike Prince Show Live. Of course, we're coming to you. Our next guest, we partially got a chance to hear from him last week, but due to the weather situation and timing was not as where it should have been, we're proud to bring back Coach Mickey Clayton. How you doing, Coach? I'm great. How are you doing? Oh, man, you sound like Tony Tiger. I'm great. <laughs> That's how those, those rattlers always are. Oh, man. Now, look, we heard you um, fading out here last week. Um, let me say welcome to the SWAC family. Uh, no stranger to competition between the SWAC, but it's a different feel now that you're part of the SWAC nation. Oh, well, actually, um uh... There's always been a, a togetherness and a unity between the MEAC and the SWAC anyway. You know, so it's like, you know, brothers from another mother. There you go. There you go. And speaking of brothers from another mother, uh, just to refresh, folks, you got a very uh, storied history with FAMU. Um, history setting um, a storied uh, venture, I should say. Men and women's basketball coach won a championship on both sides, served as athletic director. And um, so this has got to be a, a, a warm, fuzzy feeling for you guys and you personally coming over to this SWAC nation. 
Well, actually, I was the booster uh, director and assistant athletic director, but you were accurate about uh, winning conference championships in uh, men's basketball and in women's basketball. And, you know, we, we hadn't been many people to be able to do that. But right now, you know, I, I'm kind of the third of four generation rattlers. So my family is steeped in tradition. My dad and I were, I think we were the second father-son combination of going to the Family Hall of Fame. So, you know, we have a storied history, and we've been a part of the Rattler folklore, folklore for a long time. Okay, and with that being said, um, there are a lot of people in SWAC Nation who know of the FAMU legacy, but can you kind of, look, I'm going to play on your show for now, can you give us some insights on FAMU and what do you see that they will be bringing to the table. And and if you would be, as I say, transparent and see what you see their pros and cons that they bring into the conference. Well, you really, you know, I don't want to speak for the athletic director and the president because I'm retired now and sitting in a chair that's a lot more comfortable because it doesn't have as much heat on it. Uh, once you retire, every decision you make is the right one. If it's the wrong one, you claim that it was the other decision. So, right, right. But there were a lot of us that were supportive of the move that um, the athletic director and Dr. Robinson made, that uh, Courtney and Gaucher made in terms of going to the SWAC, primarily um, because of the fact that those the rivalries with the SWAC are rivalries that we have grown up with traditionally. Um, it's taken a while for us to be able to develop some of those uh, rivalries with the MEAC, in addition to cost being a tremendous factor, uh, the MEAC was developed uh, Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference for the schools in that area. It always was a tremendous amount of traveling for Bethune, Cookman, and Florida a and to travel as much as we did to go north to play. Even in basketball, we had to go up twice a year. And one trip, we went up and played three games uh, in that swing and stayed almost a week. So, but there isn't that type of travel associated with us going to the SWAC, which will help not only football, but all our other uh, sports as well in terms of being in a position where it won't be, it won't be as cost prohibitive for us to be able to make that travel. And most of these schools, we, we, we play each other. We, I mean, we follow each other. When teams have us on their schedule. They travel to Tallahassee to see the contest, which helps us. And FAMU always travels well, so, so that helps their gait as well. So the SWAC is on the way to producing or having a super conference. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. And with that being said, uh, we know the attendance uh, that FAMU brings to the table. The SWAC has already been leading the FCS the last 42 out of 43 years in attendance. And it's exciting to see the orange and green wave come into a stadium or an arena near you real soon. Um, I, I said in our opening uh, segment, uh, the way I'm feeling right now, Coach, is uh, everything is so up in the air right now, and I, maybe this is going to sound selfish, but with us uh, lining up forces, if you would, for the fam, you nation to come and be a part of the SWAC nation, let's just X – this 2020 campaign, and let's start fresh with FAM coming in, and then we'll pick it up from there. Well, do you mean – I'm not sure that I follow exactly what you're saying. Are you saying in, 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 in regard to COVID-19? Is, yes, sir. Exactly. Uh, uh, because well, right see, now – I'm one of those – Go ahead. Go I'm ahead. One of those, I'm one of those few people who believe that we have to be a, a lot more cognizant of the help of, health of our teams, period than what we've been. And everybody, except maybe the Ivy League, has been a little reticent in terms of making decisions because I think maybe in some situations they're letting the tail wag the heck out the dog. And the health of our kids, our students, are really the primary interest of what everybody should be thinking. And people are trying to rush to me, rush student-athletes back, and we have schools that are having us shut down their practice and send the students home. Um, right now, I mean, we, they're saying that we have a second wave coming. I'm not an expert, but I don't even know that we finished the first wave yet. So I, I just think that even when you look at the pro programs are slow to get back to play. 
I think right now we can almost have to take a back seat and wait and see what happens educationally before we can even start to talk about it athletically. Absolutely, and that's exactly what I was saying. Instead of just 86 to 2020 season, let's go and find a cure. Meanwhile, let your students do online courses if that's what we have to deal with right now, and then just worry about competition in 2021. And there should be a clear picture. There should be a closer remedy for some sort of cure for this virus or at least a better control factor of the virus, and let's not rush anything right now. That was exactly what I was saying. Okay, see, as what you're saying, it also intimates how many different layers there is to this. Because right now, the NCAA is in so much financial trouble as well. Uh, they used to have um, an insurance policy that allowed them to be able to receive money in case they didn't have the NCAA tournament. A couple of years ago, the president voted not to do that, not to, to pay for the insurance because it was costly and to take the money from the premium divided up to the host institutions. Well, they did that, and lo and behold, guess what happened? They don't have the NCAA tournament this past year. Because of what they had made in the past, they were able to take those funds to get through this year, this past year. But they're in trouble for the year coming up because the football money does not go to the NCAA. It goes to those individual institutions. The NCAA basketball tournament is where the money comes from that supports the NCAA. So now, if the NCAA does not have this upcoming season, what are they going to do? And in terms of that, do you now begin to put yourself in a position where maybe the conferences align themselves and do something in terms of what's best for their conference, which might not be a bad idea for some of our conferences? That's just my thought. Sometimes it's a little radical, but I try to stay ahead of the curve. Well, brother, you're in perfect company because I've been beating that drum for quite some time. Um, And let's be honest, we're getting the crumbs anyway. So let's Mm -hmm. get the biggest chunk of the crumbs, keeping things on an internal track, if you would, uh, with the regional. And then you go and get your occasional, um, quote unquote, I hate to say it, but money game. And keep things afloat. You know, it's just like we, we get excited about the Celebration Bowl, and deservedly so. And it's mm-hmm. a million-dollar purse. But throughout, if if just the conferences alone, just through the, the one conference, the SWAC, if you got 3,000 fans that believe in support of undergirding the conference to give $300, there's your – celebration bowl purse right there and Mm -hmm. you know and with all the digital networks and the opportunities that we have coming up i just think we could do a whole lot better being you know teaching us how to fish instead of giving us fish that's just my philosophy i understand it when i was a member when i was the uh the booster executive director there was always different I will have to say unproven theories that people always told you about in terms of raising money. The the thing that I always advise the many HBCU booster organizations that reached out to me to want to know how we were doing at Florida A and M is that each individual school has to find a way that sometimes you have to create your own marketing inventory inventory when there isn't any. Mm-hmm. And by that, it takes creative individuals in a place that's used to trying to sell to their constituent group. What's successful at one institution is not successful at another. And a lot of times people want to tell you, oh, man, if you get we got X number of alumni and if X number of people give X number, we'll have such and such. That is not, that's a good if, but it is not the it is not a model that has been proven anywhere. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, our institutions give the less. I remember one time the famous Dr. Frederick Humphreys, former president of Florida A&M University, one of the best presidents in the history of black colleges. I asked him one time, I said, Dr. Humphreys, why is there such a fight about us losing the law school and everything? I said, because they don't want black lawyers. He said, Mickey, Mickey, he said, I'm really disappointed in you. And I said, Dr. Humphreys, what are you talking about? He said, right now, Florida A&M has graduates that are either farmers or teachers. The board is set up that you, a lot of the money that you raise is based on your alumni and what they give. 
He said, if you have people that are engineers, that are doctors and lawyers, their ability to give far out, outweighs what a teacher and a farmer could give. Mm. He said, that's what the fight is about. That's why they fight with us about the A&Ts and Texas Southern, to have the engineering schools, to have the law schools, to have the medical colleges. He said, not so much about the number of blacks that come out in those professions, but it's the number of those who come out in those professions that could give back to the individual colleges, would now allow, uh, which now aligns them with the elite because they now have endowments that allow them to do different things. Wow. That was poetic right there, brother. Wow. Well, that was, dang, I was sitting there to Dr. Humphreys, and he's the best I've ever seen at it. But it enlightened it. I mean, it, he just shined the light on what the whole battle was about. So if I'm to hear you and understand you correctly, the fight, we still realize that we, the struggle is still real. But we still got to continue to fight for, uh, I guess, branches of deeper financial long, uh, backgrounds or support uh, possibilities. We have to fight about what we have in terms of the, the, the sound academic students that we have. There were a number, during Dr. Humphrey's time, there was, he was at Florida and we had a number of students that had perfect test scores. When we wrote proposals and grants, they made, when I was in the office up under him in development, he said that we were taught his staff that don't, you have to be more specific. He said the engineering companies, all these people want access to those students that have perfect test scores, the national merit winners that we have on campus. Include that in everything that you write. Yes, we're going to get them involved with some other programs we have at the institution. But what they want to have access to is the best of the best. And you have to illuminate those so that they are aware that they exist on our campus because these are the students that they're going to invest money in just to have the opportunity to try to talk to them. So what I'm saying is you have to be, you have to have somebody at the top who understands how that works and create entities and programs so that these people will give money back. Because even though our alumni give, it's the money that we get from the corporate dollars that really sustain the institution. Very good. Very good. So I'm hearing partnership and it has to be an internal partnership in order for this thing to reach out beyond the four walls of the campus. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I love athletics. I played basketball. I mm -hmm. coached basketball. My dad played basketball uh, at Florida and as well. I was on the team that won a championship in the SIC with only four players on the floor. I mean, so we come from an athletic background, but in it, we've never, we've never forgotten the acad. I mean, the academic component is very, very important to the future of our people, not just our institution, but our people. And so, as long as we tend to remember that, we'll be okay. But if we keep, you know, getting situation where you let the the tail wag the dog, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And right now, during this time. People don't have our people don't have a lot of money to give back. It, it's it's tough trying to pay bills, and it's gonna get tougher because too many people are losing jobs and and all of that. So the the other end of that is how are our students going to even be able to pay to go to school when it's so rough for them at home right now just to be able to make ends meet? Right, right, right. Well, that has always been a concern: the skyrocketing uh, price of uh, education, higher education, I should say. And let me ask you this, uh, Coach. Uh, do you believe that there's going to be a greater reduction of athletics? And then do you think, when I'm talking about the funding part of it, and do you think there should be some type of salary cap across the board to keep things in check? Well, we're not going to be able to keep in check with what, what they do across the street because they have a lot more things in their disposal to be able to, to raise money and make money, though they will be lessened. They still had that ability to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about a, a salary cap, and I don't think that it's. I mean, I don't even think the cost of that. I mean, uh, of tuition rising is the issue now. The tuition could go in half, and there's still going to be issues getting that paid for this forthcoming year when there's people at the house that aren't making anything. And when you see the long lines of people at the food bank 
that aren't even eating, that people that don't have jobs, life's getting turned off. You know, when you really realize it and think about it, the protests and things that are going on have taken your attention away from what was going on with COVID-19. We still have some serious health issues and life and death issues in our community. And people on furlough, are re- actually some of them are doing better than those who don't have jobs at all. Right. And so we're, we're in trouble, you know, right now for, for all that we do to try to get our kids in school. It's a luxury to be able to do that now. So it's, the, the next 12, 18 months, you know, it, it's going to be a struggle for each one of our institutions to put forth a plan that will be able to keep and maintain as many students as they can through the process and keep them moving through that pipeline. Well, I don't know about you, Coach, but in, in a lot of the students that I've been interacting with, uh, I serve uh, on a school board here locally and my involvement with, the course, the conference through athletics and academia. A lot of kids – and I'm going to say millennial kids, they are under the impression that higher education is probably one of the biggest scams going on right now. And they, they'd they rather either create their own little businesses or just go get a job. Well, I can't really, I, I can't really comment on that. I mean, because I don't have enough invested in it to have researched that. I know a lot of them wish to be their own entrepreneurs, uh, but even at that, you still have to be able to learn how to do a spreadsheet. You still have to be able to learn certain things. So I think that in a lot of cases, you know, the scam isn't so much going to college and getting a degree. And there are a lot of people who are able to get educated and trained in areas that they didn't go to college to get that they got a vocational school. You know, college isn't for everyone. There's, you know, it's not a cookie corner that, that, that presents a, a road to success. The biggest thing is what's ingrained in you and how you've been taught and how determined you are to not fail and to succeed, that regardless of when obstacles are placed in your path, that you don't let those keep you from, uh, from succeeding. Because we come from strong family backgrounds that traditionally our people are, we, we got the best of the best to survive on the boat to come over here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, it's a strong gene pool. And it's going to have to be tapped into, especially at such a time as this. Um, Coach Mickey Clayton is our first guest of this half of this week's show from Insights. And, Coach, you told us a little bit about Insights last week. Bring us up to speed and uh, let people know uh, where and how they can get some of your programming that you're offering up. Okay, Insights um, is I-N-S-I-I-G-H-T-S, two eyes in the middle. We're everywhere. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn. And what we have, we've been, uh, we just completed our fourth year on uh, broadcast television, doing our high school game of the week that we've televised men and women's basketball, football, uh, volleyball, baseball games. And we also do some HBCU components in it that, um, some black history components. We have interviews up there with Dr. Humphreys. Bill Hayes at Winston-Salem, Alvin Wyatt. We have a number of people that we've interviewed. Um, we actually have a new series we started called Sites, Insights by Sites, where we have 12 to 14 students. Um, we got a young lady who plays on Grambling's basketball team out of the, our sister, out of our conference, out of the SWAC, and from high schools, from Hampton, and we got some from Daytona Beach, UCF, and they're talking about COVID-19. They're talking about the protests. Uh, if you go to our Insights YouTube page, you'll find uh, we have four episodes up there of that. So we have a number of things in there where we, we're trying to make sure that we acknowledge and allow these students an opportunity to have a platform so we can hear what their concerns are because they are the future of what's going on, them and our grandchildren. So these are the people that are really getting ready to take over the world for us because we're not going to be here a whole lot longer. No, we're running out of time in real estate, my friend. You're absolutely right about that. <laughs> well, Coach, look, I, I hate it because we got we got a guy that you're quite familiar with coming up on the back side of things. You know anything about a guy by the name of Sheldon Hodge? 
<laughs> Tell him who used to wear the white gloves when he was a defensive coordinator here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's going to be our, our scheduled uh, guest on the backside of things right now. But, Coach, I definitely uh, look forward to us continue the dialogue and uh, continue to um, welcome and break you in swag style. And you, you, you're going to be talking about strike, strike, and strike again. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. So all of you listeners out there, make sure you follow us at Insights, I-N-S-I-I, G-H-T-S, two eyes in the middle. We're everywhere. Please tell Sheldon that I said hello, and we will see him soon. All right, my friend. That was Coach Mickey Clayton of Insights, fam, you legend himself. We're going to take us a break, and we'll get ready to have more of tonight's episode here from the Open Mic Broadcast Network. We'll be right back. Keep it where you got it. Are you looking to expand your business or services? Let the Open Mic Broadcast Network help lead the way. With our customized campaigns, we are definitely able to reach your target audience. For more information, dial 832-213-8824. The Open Mic Broadcast Network, serving the community through faith and athletics. The voice of student athletics. Rob Butler with his Southland Report. The SCS playoffs have come to be the unofficial North Dakota State Invitational, but it will not change how on Selection Sunday, November 22nd, 24 teams will jump on the road to Frisco, Texas, a bunch even harboring championship dreams. Now I'm looking in the crystal ball early to see which teams from the Southland Conference can be expected to qualify for the field. First, I have Central Arkansas as the Southland champ. Now, here's a fast fact. The 2019 co-Southland champ was the only playoff team to average under 100 yards rushing per game. They averaged 88.8, which was ranked 118th nationally. Their pivotal game this season is Nichols at home on September 26th. Next, I have Nichols as an at-large qualifier. Last fact, as a sophomore last year, Julian Gomes set program records for rushing yards over 1,200 and rushing touchdowns with 16. Their pivotal game is at Central Arkansas on September 26th. Next, I have Sam Houston State as an at-large qualifier. The Bearcats' 99 wins during the 2010s were the second in the FCS North Dakota State with 137. Their pivotal game is at home with Central Arkansas November 7th. And last, I have Southeastern Louisiana as an at-large qualifier. Last fact is this. The Lions were the only FCS teams to have five 500-yard receivers a year ago. Their pivotal game is Central Arkansas at home on November the 14th. And that's Rob Butler, Open Mic Broadcast Network. It's the Open Mic Tele Network Line. Dial 720-721-1558 and instantly at your fingertips you have the latest local news, weather, and sports. Need a word of encouragement? Dial 720-721-1558. The Open Mic Tele Network Line features weekly prayer, verse of the week, and local ministries at your fingertips. Everything you need on demand. Dial 720-721-1558. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. No internet, no problem. No Wi-Fi, no problem. No app, no problem. All you need to do is dial 720-721-1558. Listen now. Serving the community through faith and athletics. The Open Mic Broadcast Network. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mike Prince Show Live. Of course, we come to you each and every day and come to you live on Sunday night, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Our first guest, Mickey Clayton. As I told you guys, you would enjoy him. Got the right name for his program, Insights. Dropped a lot of information and knowledge. And that's part of the enhancement of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Our next guest is no stranger to the SWAC, no stranger to the MEAC. I'm going to go out there and call him a living legend right now. On the 1978 
national championship football team of the Fam Rattlers, Mr. Sheldon Hodge. How you doing this evening, sir? I'm doing great, Mike. How are you? I'm doing real good. Let me first say thank you for uh, gracing us with your presence here uh, with the Open Mic Broadcast Network. And Mickey Clayton sends his hellos. Well, it's always wonderful, uh, you know, to hear from Mickey. He was an outstanding uh, basketball coach uh, at Florida A&M University as well as player. Yes, sir. Now, uh, I know that you got to be excited about FAMU uh, coming over to the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Uh, you and I spoke a little bit earlier this week, and you said it's been a long time coming. But before we actually get into that part, I want you to take us back, sir, to 1978. And you and your, your teammates were able to accomplish something that I personally don't think we'll see, at least not in my lifetime, coming again. And because of that, you all kind of had them set some rules to rearrange some things. Well, well, hopefully uh, you will see it uh, in your lifetime and in the very near future. Uh, but back in uh, 1978, uh, you know, what we were able to do uh, really started back in uh, 1975. Um, Coach Rudy Hubbard went out and recruited a group of student athletes and we came into uh, Florida and then university. It was about 30 of us. And uh, at the end, in 1978, only 13 of us remained. But all of us was uh, summa cum laude, magna cum laude, you know, type of uh, student athletes. And uh, with us, Coach Hubbard was able uh, to put in an audible system, both both offensively and defensively, and we were able to uh, study film on our opponent and uh, make adjustments on the field. So at, at, at one point in every football game, the game was actually being uh, called by the student athletes on both offense and defense based on a lot of uh, uh, film study uh, you know, throughout the week. Absolutely. And of course, that led to the magical season of 1978. And and it, it, are you able to remember vividly in your mind, uh, and if you don't mind, I'm going to call you Coach Hodge, about the, the, the step toward that championship in 78? Well, you know, uh, coming off of an undefeated season uh, in uh, 1977, being the only undefeated and untied team, uh, you know, in the United States of America, uh, you know, we applied for uh, one double A, and we were hoping that we'd get an opportunity, you know, uh, to uh, play in the playoffs. But uh, it wasn't an automatic bid for us. Uh, uh, at the end of the season, we were. Uh, we had only lost one game. That was to Tennessee State University in 1978. And we had Grambling State University uh, in Orange Blossom Classic in Miami. And uh, some kind of way, you know, the administration worked out a deal uh, with the NC2A. And they said, okay, if you beat Grambling uh, conventionally uh, down in Miami, then we'll consider letting you in. And uh, we did beat Grambling. Uh, by, I think, right around 30 points uh, down uh, in Miami. And uh, we got the, the last bid, the last play in, and we were slated to play uh, Jackson State uh, University and Memorial Stadium uh, here in Mississippi. And uh, we were able to defeat uh, Jackson State by a score of 12 to 10. Now, Mike, at that point, uh, we uh, we saw the figure that we had an outstanding opportunity uh, to be the first ever uh, NC two A one AA national uh, champions, and uh, we had to wait on uh, the team that we would play. And uh, on and on December 16, nineteen seventy eight, they matched us in the Pioneer Bowl in Wichita Falls, Texas, against the University of Massachusetts, and uh, we were able to defeat. 
able to defeat Massachusetts 35-28. Wow. Just like yesterday, huh, Coach? <laughs> it's something you'll never forget. It's something you'll never forget, you know, playing uh, you know, playing in a championship game, having an opportunity to uh represent uh not your not only your alma mater, but uh HBCUs all across the country. And uh this was our golden opportunity uh to show the world that, you know, we belong, you know, in this arena and and we wanted to make sure that we took full advantage of it and make sure that it wasn't an accident. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, in your earlier statement, you seem very optimistic that this can uh, recreate itself. And with the way things are structured, especially through the FBS, are you saying this can recreate itself through the FCS format, or you think it can be on the larger scale of FBS? Well, I think I think it can. It, it can happen. But uh, we as uh, HBCUs, uh, there's going to be something that we're going to have to give up. And uh, naturally, if we're going to be a, a part of the playoffs, uh, and this is going to be asking for a whole lot, when you start talking about giving up a Florida Classic, perhaps a Celebration Bowl, or even perhaps a, a Bayou Classic, because some of the top teams are the top teams, or uh, HBCU teams in the nation will be playing at the same time, they're having the uh, the FCF playoffs, and uh, if we ever going to do it again, then we have to give a little in order to get a little, and it's going to come through our administration. Okay. Well, a lot of people that are going to be listening to this will say, "Well, the finances just don't balance themselves out." So they say, "Give up a little, we'll be giving up a lot with the paydays that you get from those classics that you just mentioned." And some of them say that that's the risk is not worth the reward. Well, you know, uh, we've been we've been uh, people of risk, you know, for a mighty mighty long time. You know, we've been uh, risking ourselves playing the Mississippi States, playing the University of Miami's, and uh, a lot of these Division One schools uh, over the years. Uh, I remember my very first year of coaching. Uh, back in 1979, coming off of that national championship team, and and Rudy gave me an opportunity to coach uh, football at Florida A&M University. Uh, we faced uh, a private school out of Miami called the University of Miami Hurricanes, and uh, and that was in 1979. Uh, they wouldn't come to our stadium to play us. They played us at Dope Campbell Stadium. Uh, on the campus of Florida State University, but at the end of the day, uh, the score was uh, damn you from the HBCU 16 University of Miami 13. So uh, it could happen. And we're still playing those schools now. And uh, back then it wasn't a big payday, but a lot of our institutions are making uh, upwards of a million dollars a year playing those uh playing those Division One schools, and we got to look towards uh, maybe scheduling more of those Division One schools, you know, uh, putting money in our kitties, maybe sharing a little of our funds with our other HBCU brothers throughout our conferences, but uh, we got to make a sacrifice, and, uh, and we, can, we can make it back. Boy, you know what? I, I'm hearing you, Coach, and I think that's going to be a hard sell, especially for people that's, that's, that's scraping, trying to make, as they say, make ends meet. But but I'm going to help keep the light on for you to help see the cause because I've always stated that if we're going to be a part of the FCS, then we need to try to reap all the benefits from being a part of it because there's no sense of us paying all those fees if we're not going to be a part of everything that's available to us. Well I, still, I, well, I definitely agree with you, Mike. Now, if we're, we're not going to be a part of the playoff system and everything available, then let's go back to a uh, mutual uh, uh, black network and, 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 and let's pick our uh, All-Americans. Let's pick our uh, national champions and, 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 and take that route. But, but, but I'm here to tell you that over the years, over the last 40 years or so, uh, all the people I came in contact with 
uh, after winning back to back national championships, uh, going 11 and 0 and then 12 and 1, uh, nobody on the other side uh, really respected uh, our 11 and 0 season. Nobody respected that. You know, I'm, I'm constantly asked all the time uh, by uh, or people on the other side uh, about that. Uh, you know, that 1978 team, uh, uh, the University of Massachusetts, after we defeated them. But, but I'm here to tell you, uh, uh, some of our greatest battles uh, have been against Grambling, have been against Southern Tennessee State, Alcorn, you know, Jackson State, uh, 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 the University of Massachusetts uh, was a great team, but it didn't measure up to those HBC U programs uh, during my era. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you got a lot of the old heads who are really, really upset uh, at segregation. They said that that the uh, the other institutions came and took the cream of the crop of our players, left us to starve, and they took the players and they've made all these billions of dollars and then they turn their noses up to us in this right now era. Well, you know, uh, could be a lot of truth in that, and I'm, and I'm sure it is. And as I look back on my recruitment uh, uh, many, many years ago, uh, I know in 1975 when uh, Sheldon Hodge and John King uh, signed with Florida a and m and uh, uh, Ricky Jackson signed with the University of Pittsburgh. He decided to to go and play alongside another Mississippian, uh, Hugh Green, you know, out of, uh, out of Natchez. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, uh, but I really felt that out, out of the top four players in Florida, the, the number one linebacker, you know, probably was uh, Ronaldo Muse out of Pihoki. And then, uh, and then Ricky was out of Pihoki. And, uh, and, and and one decided to preach on uh, Ronaldo Muse. You know, I'm told. I always tried to uh, learn my history. That's one thing that was impressed upon us, you know, at Florida a and So when uh, Ronaldo Muse decided to preach, and Ricky Jackson went to Pittsburgh, and John King and Sheldon Hodge came uh, to Florida a and then hey, we, 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 we thought Florida a and was able to sign two of the best Two of the best four linebackers, you know, uh, in the state of Florida at that time, in my opinion, who were Afro-Americans. Hey, 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 you know what? You're not going to get no argument out of me because in that time, sir, I was a, a knee grasshopper walking around trying to figure out wh- which which direction was north, south, east, or west. So you are definitely not getting any uh, argument from me. And history shows me that you can stand right flat-footed and speak that truth because you all backed up whatever you had to say. So you won't have no problem with me with that one. <laughs> We're talking right now with Sheldon Hodge, Coach Sheldon Hodge, um, 1978 team um, of the national state champion, not national state, but national champions of college football. And um, you've had the honor of coaching you talked about coaching at family, but you coached at Mississippi Valley for 12 seasons, right, Coach? Well, that's, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, I started my football career at Florida a and University. had an opportunity to coach some, uh, you know, great uh, football players at Florida a and m Many went on to uh, play professional football and uh, coach against some, uh, you know, some great athletes. You know, in the uh, Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, as well as the MEAC, and then uh, ultimately came on uh, to the Southwestern Conference and uh, had an opportunity to coach against some outstanding coaches and outstanding players. Uh, you know, guys like uh, you know Steve McNair. Yes, you sir. Know, just to name a few. Yes, sir. Now uh, we know that you uniquely uh, the the budget cycle, I guess I'll put it in, for Mississippi is kind of unique than other sister conference schools. And I I found it very interesting. We broke down the budgets for the Southwestern Athletic Conference and including FAMU. And the 10th 
budget out of 11 conferences, and we're talking football right now, is all corn state at $7.1 million for all athletics. And then Valley was at $4.1 million. Mm. But all corn with a budget of 7.1, let me give you the top four, and this will really make you go, uh. Okay. Alabama State, $13.6 million. Prairie View A&M University, $13.2 million. Texas Southern University, $12.3 million. Alabama A&M, $11.7 million. Now, just off the top of your head, when you hear that kind of money compared to a $7.1 million and a $4.1 million, you would think that the ties would have been reversed. Now, there are a couple of angles that I'm going at with this. If Mississippi Valley at 4.1, $3 million behind Alcorn, who has been probably the most consistent and dominant football program in the SWAC for the past 10 years, isn't that hope that Valley is not as far off as it may sound? Well, well, that's definite. That's definite. You know, when you look at uh, all the things that make all corn, all corn, you know, uh, you know, the history, you know, the, uh, the commitment, you know, from alumni, the support, you know, when a guy, when a guy goes all corn and they used to say years ago, uh, when he crossed over the cattle gap, uh, into all corn, you know, on, on, into uh, brave territory. Then uh, that guy changes, you know. He he, he metamorphosizes, and, 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 and he becomes more than uh, he could ever imagine himself. You know, uh, uh, there's magic, uh, you know, down there, uh, you know, in those woods. You know, I like to say I like to say woods, you know, because I've been down there uh, uh, six or seven years, you know. Uh, you know, coaching uh, college football. And uh, 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 it's magic down there, and people believe, and and, and the guys buy in. Uh, I really believe if our boys come back, mm. and if our boys learn their history, it don't have to be the number one guy. It don't have to be the number one guy. All corn, Mississippi Valley, a lot of those programs do more with less. Mm-hmm. than any other institution in the country. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And like you said, you're only a couple of key players away from turning the whole thing around. So I guess the encouraging message is keep fighting the good fight and the change is going to come. And just when you think you had all that you can take, here comes the rescue. Here comes the cavalry. That's true. That's true. You know, I just always think about a, 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 a man who – who didn't know, didn't know where he was. He thought he was uh, on the 14th floor, but, uh, you know, he was on the second floor, and he was he was hanging out the window, and somebody was slamming the window seal along his fingers, and he was afraid to let go because he thought that uh, once he hit the ground, that that, that his body would, would burst and be destroyed. And then finally, when he got tired of of his fingers being crushed, he let go, and he realized he only had two or three feet to drop. Mm. Mm-hmm. And see, that's where we are. We're not that. We're not that far away. Okay. We're not that far away. But what we got to have, Mike, we got to have players who believe in us. When I say us, I'm talking about Swag, Miac. S I A C C I double A. I'm talking about HBCUs, and we have to have coaches and administrators that believe in HBCU. Okay, so it's the form of the, the, the form got to be more. It's got to be more than a paycheck. Okay, the, so the formula really lies within. And if I'm hearing That's you right. correctly, work with what you got. Don't complain about where you're lacking. Maximize it because as a body, as a nation of people. We've mastered that anyway, working with what you got and then formulate the system. And I think, Coach, you can't run the same system that I see Coach Sheldon running. I got to run a system with the players that I have and the budget that I can afford. Would that help be part of it? Uh, uh, Definitely. You know, uh, you have to to come in, you have to assess 
you know what your strong points are. You got to know your weak points. You got to know what they are, and you got to go to work. You can't make excuses. We don't. Nobody listens to excuses. Nobody. Nobody cares. Yes, you know they give you a they give you a black eye and a contract for next year because they <laughs> because they looking they looking for an easy win. Yes, sir. You know, quit complaining. Roll your sleeves up. Go to work. Believe in your players. Believe in your coaches. And if you believe in one another, there's not a stronger uh, a stronger bond that you can set uh, in this world than believing in one another. Yes, sir. The band of brothers. We're talking right now with uh, Coach Sheldon Hodge of FAMU and of Mississippi Valley, but uh, uh, duly noted for the championship that they achieved 1978 on the national football scale. Now, Coach, uh, we just talked about bringing back the glory of the heritage of our HBCU programs. How do you sell that in this 21st century? Well, you know, uh, we have to sell it ourselves. You know, we have a lot of alumni you know, all across the country and all in all different walks of life, you know, and uh, we have to just buckle down. We have to put together a plan or we have commissioners in, uh, in every league. Let's sit down. Let's create uh, uh, workshops, you know, uh, for these uh, HBCU coaches, you know, uh, first of all, they have to learn they have to learn uh, the history. You know, a lot of them don't know because they haven't been a part. There you go. So they, they have to learn the history. Once they learn the history and pass those uh, the history on to their players, uh, you know, we have a chance. Now, now it, now, it wasn't difficult for me. I have to admit at Florida a and when, when you walk in there and, and, and there's Rudy Hubbard and and he's uh, telling you about the history of Ohio State uh, University. And then you got uh, Bobby Lane, you got Casa Killers, you got Robert Mudgeon, uh, you got a staff of Florida and them graduates. Uh, you got Coach Jake Gaither uh, uh, visiting the field and talking with you, or uh, Robert Pete Griffin. Uh, it was a requirement, just like, uh, just like. You have two new voice messages and eight saved messages. You learn of the greatness, and then you want to add to and be a contributor, you know, to that greatness. And, and I'm so proud today to say that I was able to add to and contribute to that greatness. Well, sir, we are definitely uh, excited, and you got to promise us because we're running close to the end of our episode for this week. But you got to promise that we're going to keep in contact and we're going to keep some dialogue going. Is that is that something I can count on, sir? Well, well you know, my, my door is always open when it comes to uh, black college athletics, uh, athletics, period. You know, my door, my door is always open because uh, I would like to see uh, in my lifetime another HBCU get the job done. Now, I was able to see something that uh, my parents weren't able to see in their lifetime was a Barack Obama yes. uh, uh, sitting in the White House. Yes, sir. Some people say it will never happen. I never dreamed it could happen, but I was able to see it yes, sir. because we stood the course. Yes, and uh, if we stand the course, I guarantee you there'll be another HBCU at the top of the FCS. Well, you know what, sir? With that being said, I'm going to have to go hold on and try to carry the torch for you because I feel inspired enough. If I had some more eligibility, I think I'd try to get out there and make it happen for you, coach. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you sound like a player. I, I, I did okay, coach. I did okay. I did okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, as I say, toot my own horn, but I got one I can carry. How'd that sound? Hey, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and fam, you, you know, people used to ask, say, hey, was this guy a, a, a good football player? And, and the old coach used to say, hey, he was a starter. 
<laughs> and, uh, and, and that was all that needed to be said. Yeah. Not how many years, not was he all American. He was a starter. Well, and we had, well, and we had, we, we, and we had three teams you could start on. Well, Coach. offense, defense, <laughs> and special teams. Well, I was a starter, Coach. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Look, man, this has truly, truly been a blast. And while I got you, how do you think your Rattlers going to do in the swag, man? They've been coming in with a lot of vanglory and a lot of hype talk. How you think they going to well, do? Well, you know, uh, well, you know, you know, that's uh, that, that, that's part of being a rattler, you know. Uh, uh, I think it's a, it's good for you know the conference. I think in due time, I think uh, Florida and them is going to do well. Uh, it's not going to be easy. You have a lot of great teams. You have a lot of great history here. You lot of, have a lot of great coaches uh, in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And I tell you, if they're going to come in here and win a championship, they're going to have to work tough. Well, the work is definitely done. We want to thank you on tonight, sir. God bless you. It was great to hear the stories, and we'll get some more dialogues in. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pressed up against the clock. I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. Thank our guests on tonight. We just heard from legendary Sheldon Hodge and Mickey Clayton. I am the radio guy. Don't forget to join us each and every day right here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. I've got to go. i got to exit stage left. But until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.